Yo, yo, yo. It's the Here Castaway we are. Oh. Were we on time today? <laughs> no. Are we ever on time? <laughs> what kind of time are you talking about? Like our, our, our makeup real time or what? <laughs> oh, man. What time, what time do we make it on? 8.18? Yeah. That's normal yeah. time. That's our normal <laughs> time, I guess, eh? That's a normal time for us, meeting. We started talking with Bob backstage, and it's like, oh my god, we could have went for the next four hours, and I just, just <laughs> listened to this. I was going to tell yeah. Eric, just cue it in, just let's go. Let's just go live right now. Let's, let's go. go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Music South, thanks for joining us again. It is Monday, April 25, the Cast and Nick podcast, a regular time slot at 8.15, a regular late slot at 8.18 or whatever. A little bit late. Oh, yeah. Late, late early, or right on time. <laughs> That's normal Filipino time. Everyone on Facebook, everyone on YouTube, thanks for joining us. Give us a sub if you like what you see. It's Jeremy Santos, Mike Tatola, and Eric Labopa over here. We've got a whole pile of stuff to talk about. Snow. Lots of snow. Too much of it. No more snow. We've got we've got it's all uh, water now, man. We've got the legend, of course, coming on the show here. He's actually sitting backstage. He's in the green room. If you don't you don't believe us, we got a green room. We got a green room, eh? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bob's enjoying the libations in the green room right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, man, here we go. Here we go. Let's get into this, man. I can find the comments here. Hello from Thunder Bay. Dave, Dave's in Thunder Bay today. David yeah. Dutcher, hello. Big Vinny is in the house. Cool G is always here first. Quinton is in the house. Late. You shut the hell up, Quinton. <laughs> right on time, man. Yeah. It's normal time. Rob Razor is here. Jesse Bellet, Real Life with Mike. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Yeah, we got, we got things to get to, but basically it's just a lot of, I mean, my idol's here, man. He's our hero. Him. He's our yeah, hero, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is awesome that he's here. And uh, yeah. this is the first show of the open water season. We got some sponsors to shout out to. Of course, the show is brought to you by Kicker Fish and uh, Two Rivers Bolt Works. Uh, thank you, of course. We've got. Uh, let me let me let me try some things out here. What I got here? Do I got? Do I got slides? I hope you got. You did before. Ah, oh, that took up the whole screen. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> We're coming on board for open water or sponsor this season. Our open water goes from May. We're like a week earlier or whatever, but yeah. although it feels like January. May, June, July, all the way down to the fall, open water season. Thank you, Lawrence, uh, for coming on board. Appreciate that. Uh, as well as Markham, the underwater camera of choice of the Castanet podcast. Markham is on board as open water sponsor. Uh, we've also got Tight Lines UV, Northern Waters. Thank you, man. Mike Garza, thank you for coming on board as open water sponsor. Uh, we've got Walleye Wars. Dallas Kirkpatrick is helping out there. Walleye Wars. Uh, those events will be coming up soon. We'll be talking about that as, as the summer comes on board here. Uh, lots of cool prizes and stuff. Of course, our show sponsor for a long time now, Team Fui Automotive. Contact Dylan Fui for all your automotive needs. Uh, one of the top selling Honda dealerships and all kinds of brands over there. Check out the cool new boat, too, or whatever. That was yeah. last year. But nice wrap, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a nice yeah. wrap. Yeah. And we've got our show supporters of the open water season. Thank you to Kalen's Mustang Survivor on Acme. Jeremy's got another one on the way, too. We'll announce that next week as well. Thank you, man. Yeah. So that's everybody right there. Fantastic. So I mean, we're moving up in the world. We're actually getting sponsors. <laughs> just to let us start, eh? There's always been sponsors. It's just that <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to change how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to be good because we got Mr. Zuby here, man. So we're trying to be good. We got to be good now, man. No, we're good, man. Oh, so this means this is my last show. This is my <laughs> Joe Tilly in Alberta, what's going on? Yeah, but we've got people from Alberta, uh, BC, Cliff Moore watches from the island. We've got people in uh, Minnesota, North Dakota, uh, Northwest Ontario, Saskatchewan, of course, our good friends in Saskatchewan. And one uh, and one from France. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> Everybody, right. Hey, he's still there, right? Eh? I don't he's even know. There, yeah. I don't even know if Bob knows that uh, this is an interactive show. So it's live. We're we are one of yeah. live, unscripted, and uh, it's interactive. So we got comments and uh, yeah, some questions from the audience. Uh, we'll see, man. Resmar, I still haven't put my winter tires back on. It's warmer. <laughs> I know. I, I can't believe the snow here we've got. Like, let me let me show you a picture of downtown Winnipeg right now. Uh, Bob doesn't believe us. That's downtown Winnipeg right now. <laughs> the Star Wars at at Walkers, man. Eh? That's how bad it is out here. <laughs> so late, it reminds me of the speed of the lake style. I, oh, come on. We're, we're doing good. We're doing good here. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Leon. What's going on? Yeah, man. We've got all kinds of stuff here. This is a cool one here. There's an ice fishing derby on May 14. <laughs> went to launch. On this opening day, Bob, you're in Southern Division of Manitoba. Opening day is May 14. Uh, we're going to have an ice fishing derby. And I think they're only half joking. Gary and Heather at Goodwood Shell Lodge are half joking. If there's ice still, which a lot of the lakes will have ice, let's go. Ice someone, someone will enter that tournament, that derby. 
I, you know, I, someone I will. Sorry for the one lake that's going to be open because <laughs> there's probably be about 200 boats sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I gotta, I gotta show this lad here. One second, and uh, we're gonna get Mr. Zumi on here. Shout out to the NBA Falcon Lake Bass Classic. Uh, get your entries in. I don't think it's gonna happen on May 14th. Uh, the the ice out date is May 28th. But yeah. uh, get your entries in NBA Amateur Bass Trail. We we're talking with Bob there about all the crazy tours and uh, series is out east. Uh, but we've got an awesome one here, the Amateur Bass Trail. They say amateur, but these are fantastic anglers that hold uh, good sticks that can hold up anywhere. But uh, get your entries in for that one there. The NBA uh, contact them for more information. Fantastic. And then one more. Get your tickets in for this boat raffle. It's a land. There's a Mercury on there. There you go, Bobby. You'll be happy. There's a Mercury on the back of this one. <laughs> you win it. Uh, $20 per ticket, only 2000 sold. It's a it's a Lund Fury. We talked about this last week. You could resell it for $48,000 right now. So a 14-foot boat. There you go. <laughs> get your tickets in. All right. <laughs> I'll stop you. Uh, and this might. One more news and note. We, we talked about Final Destination where we uh, – Oh, uh, my God. A whole generation over was traumatized. Everybody. This really happened. Gary Atkins is a pro anger down south. It happened, Mike. It happened. You see me looking over there. Me and Mike are in the same room. We're in the same room, yeah. You can actually look. look you can, you can, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. It looks, like, it looks like we're not in the same room. But don't follow those logging trucks. Be careful. You don't want to be beside them. Yeah, but they always fall off the sides. The side, he back. said. That's what happened there. Yeah, don't go felt, beside it then. Don't go beside it. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> unreal bob izumi what do you guys know about bob izumi who is this guy who is bob the god of fishing man somebody that everybody what he has is. watched for years yes this is like truly my idol man i, I like like i was saying before when like uh like and not just because asian canadian kind of thing or whatever that's what sort of attracted me to it like oh is this guy on tv that's what we get <laughs> Because we used to watch your shows, like I said, on TNN. TNN would have like uh, Hank Parker and, and yeah. Bill Dance, all that kind of stuff. And then you turn it on to like Global or something like that. And, and all of a sudden, who's this guy? He's Canadian. Oh, and that was it. That started the love. That was back in the 80s or whatever it was. Way back. Way back. 80s. Way, way back. Way back. And uh, yeah. you guys are probably still in grade school back in the 80s, right, Eric? Mike was already well into his career in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> I was. You were happy to retire in the 80s, man. <laughs> He's already retired. <laughs> Bill Corrigal's here. Thanks again to Lawrence. Uh, like I said, brand new sponsor, open water season. Lawrence uh, coming on board, Casting Fox. Appreciate that. Bill Corrigal, uh, good buddies with uh, with Bob Zumi, hooked it up kind of thing. He's here. We're, we're going to – let's bring him in. He's like, bring him in, man. Are you done in the green room, bro? What everyone's we're, waiting for. We're going to bring He's him in. He's ready to talk. <laughs> let's get him in. Wow, I'm Bob still, and Zumi. Welcome. I'm still looking for the food. Where, where's the food in this green room? <laughs> we, don't, we don't have enough sponsors, <laughs> sponsors yet for that. <laughs> I'm going to get a cocktail and maybe a couple more <laughs> d'oeuvres or something. That's right. Oh, man, I can't believe it. Man. I can't you, believe it. you know what? I, I've been watching you guys now for the last few minutes. You guys are like the CNN headline news, whatever, of fishing. You cover it all, right? Like oh, yeah. news, everything. Everything. Accidents oh. and ice fishing derbies in the summer and everything, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. about about a week ago, Eric almost quit this job to go do uh, the weatherman. I was on <laughs> CBC <laughs> last week, Bob. I was on CBC doing weather, weather. stuff out front, That's just a spoof. <laughs> in other words, I can only believe half of what you say if you're going to enter that. <laughs> trap, he, right? he does believe in sasquatches and stuff, so you got to watch out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, wait till I get started on sasquatch. sasquatch. <laughs> But no, anyway, they're all in Manitoba. We don't have them here in Ontario. <laughs> Come on, there is. Don't get me started, but we're gonna talk about Bob here now. Right? Next, next show. <laughs> oh, what is, is there still ice where you are? Like, where are you based? By the way, if no one. Knows. <laughs> I'm in my house right now, but uh, uh, right, uh, what would I be? About a half hour west of uh, the GTA, a half hour west of Toronto. So I'm out in the country, outside of Milton, and. Uh, no, everything's opened up now, and uh, it's uh, fishable. You know, they're banging lots of walleyes in the Detroit River and uh, giant perch down on Lake Erie and panfish are biting. Every, everything's hitting right now. It's uh, pretty much just getting into full swing. Today was kind of, the last couple of days have been kind of the nicer days we've had, though. It's been been a pretty cool cool spring. It's a lot of, a lot of cold weather, and, you know, the uh, we had snow probably a week ago, the, about three inches of snow, but only lasted, you know, for a day and then got warm again and disappeared. But 
been a weird spring, but uh, I know it's gonna you know come around. And uh, today was rain, so it's like we're getting it all right now. But uh, life is good. Yeah, can't complain. I don't complain about the weather because you know what? I can't change that. That's the only thing I know. I I <laughs> can't right, change. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome, man. You got lot, getting lots of love in the comments. Here. I'm sure you could see it all just popping up on your screen there. All kinds of stuff. Here, well, so. we, we talked so much before you guys went live that I'm just going to let you guys tell them what I told you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we'll just ask the question. We'll ask you again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what if I get? what if I change the whole story from what I told you before we went live? <laughs> well, then, you, then you just become a true fisherman. <laughs> there you go. Oh, weather, man. <laughs> Steve Sasaki's, you know, it was it was me and Steve who uh, were hanging out with you, or well, we were fanboying hard in Sturgeon Bay. It was me and Steve Sasaki yeah, there. At the, oh, yeah, at the rental house there. Yeah. The, well, we still got that house actually. Stroob somehow negotiated with the new owners that do not rent it out to get it again. Now uh, the last, uh, I think the last tournament they owned it uh, before COVID when we were there last time a few years ago, and then this year again uh, next week we're heading down there and. It's funny you think next week. It seems like it's coming up quick, but uh, yeah. we're going to leave, uh, I think, Thursday and probably stop at Mercury. I'm just waiting uh, on an answer back from uh, one of my buddies at Mercury down in Fond du Lac, but might stop there for a little tour on our way through. I'd, I've never been to the Merc plant, um, you know, for a tour, so I'd, I'd love to go see it and especially see where they're making all these these big uh, V6s and V12s and V8s and everything else is, you know, so. Yeah, that's awesome. Bob, yeah. do you think you can drop Jeremy Santos just a couple pointers how to land fish? How to which? How to land fish. Oh, yeah? He's having issues? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, okay. hey, not, hey, not the last day of ice fishing, man. Come nah. on. He People forget already. Just... See? He's got People a straight throw in this hand, and he's got a cell phone in this hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. So he's multitasking. Yeah. That's the problem. Trying to film, it, you know, it, it, it's funny how, you know, with everything going on nowadays and everybody involved in the social media stuff, it, you know, like I had my daughter and my wife with different cameras shooting in the rain this afternoon. We had company. My uh, my niece was brought over her new little baby and my my daughter has a baby now that uh um, you know, my son-in-law and daughter have a, a, a baby, my grandson, first uh, one I've had. So it was Congrats, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That, as soon as they left today, it started pour. So we're outside to get a Columbia out dry video because I, I'm using a lot of their out dry extreme uh, rain wear. And I needed rain for a couple of shots for social. And it's like, it doesn't happen when you want it to. And then all of a sudden, like I had five minutes to get ready because this dark cloud came over and we we're out there shooting and I was, it was so funny. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking to myself at 63 years old, I'm really not a male model. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to refer to us as athletes, just so you guys know. So I'm an athlete, not a model. Okay. <laughs> Baby sumo. <laughs> a lot of people say we're not worthy. Kind of I just, this is way back at the mid Canada boat show in 2016. This is a, uh, just ambushed you. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> did I give you? Did I give you twenty American or Canadian? <laughs> and I was interviewing with a fake mic. I don't remember that. That was a fake Barbie microphone. It wasn't even real. Yeah. How long ago uh, was that? Oh, I need. I'm still waiting. You said you're gonna buy me a new one, so I've been waiting. All this time. Yeah. Well, yeah. You probably don't know. Everybody looks at me and says, "Oh yeah, you're Asian, right?" I am, but that's from the waist down. I'm Scottish from the waist up. Okay, so I got the alligator arm top. So you're gonna be waiting for a while on that microphone. <laughs> hey, maybe I can give you one now though, because I'm not using them like I used to for the TV show. So I got lots Look around us. now. <laughs> so 38, 38 seasons. Like uh, you were telling us how it started. Like share a little bit, like with them, like uh, the Cliff Notes version. Well, how this actually started. The short version is. Um, for three years, uh, around 1980, 81, I, 
I starved to death doing nothing but promotional work in the fishing industry and tournaments. Made enough to barely eat on, but not enough to certainly uh, make a real good living at it. And so in 1983, I happened to be at a family picnic, met an older gentleman who owned a one-man advertising agency called Memory Bank. His name was Bob McGuigan. He was about, uh, gosh, he would have been like 35 years older than me. A real veteran when it came to creative and advertising and stuff like that. And he owned this, this small agency in Guelph, Ontario. And the family picnic, we're talking, and he says, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm fishing for a living, but it's tough. I mean, I'm the only guy in Canada that's actually a so-called professional angler back in like yeah. that era. And I said, I think I'm going to have to do something like a TV show or something to supplement my addiction to tournament fishing because i fish tournaments now since i was 15 years old been addicted to them ever since and i still love fishing that's all i think about when it comes to fishing is when's the next tournament so anyway uh we exchanged numbers in about a week later i was on my way to a bass tournament and he lived about halfway to this tournament so i stopped in his place in guelph and we stayed up till five in the morning talking about this tv show concept that i I had ran by him at the, the picnic and, and uh, then he knew a cameraman who shot rock videos like Joe Cocker and all these uh, famous musicians uh, and, and Ted Wakeford was his name. He had long hair and, and uh, he like, you know, I think I was, I was saying earlier, looked like Jethro Tall. I mean, he had this long bushy hair and, and he was, you know, more of a, um, you know, rock video type guy. And that was back in the early days of rock videos too, actually, now that I think of it. And he was our first camera guy, and we went out and shot a pilot and took that pilot to 13, uh, 12 stations in Ontario. And one program director happened to be visiting another program director at uh, Ottawa, and he was from Pembroke. And he said, I'll take the show from my station, too. So we picked up 13 stations the first year, Ontario only, 13 episodes. Yeah. Next year, we went 26 episodes across the country, and then the rest is history. And that was like 83 uh time frame and then did it for 38 years and throughout my whole tv career and magazine and radio show that like we did those for over 30 years as well i always said that you know when can i wind all this down so i can go fish tournaments again and do some promotional work and sort of get back to my roots but when can i do that and i thought 45 and then i thought 50 years old and then i thought 55 and then last year at 63 we wound it down and Pre-COVID, about six months before COVID hit is when I'd made the my, my mind up. I kind of shocked everybody. My son, who was my cameraman, my wife, who's been with me for, for 35 years. I mean, I shocked everybody when I said, going to wind it down because I kind of just came home one day. And said, you know what? I think it's time to just wind down. Things were good. You know, we had all the sponsors and everything. But you know what? All good things must come to an end. I've been been there, done that traveled the world went to places like crazy places like uh you know the amazon and and uh tasmania and and australia and spain and you know venezuela and all kinds of even russia i mean not the best country to talk about right now because i don't really agree with what they're doing but we even shot there just after the wall came down and and so having done that and done all these bucket list trips i still would come back thinking any, I'd still be there wherever I was on location, thinking about the next tournament I was fishing rather than getting the show shot at hand. So, you know what? The timing was right. And, uh, you know, I want to fish turns till I can't walk anymore. And I, I still can walk and move around. So the timing, uh, I think, wasn't bad. I mean, I'd like to have done it, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but uh, it is what it is. And now I can move forward. And you know what? I, I'm not into looking in the rear view mirror too much. You know, I like looking to the next thing and the next thing. And that's probably a fault. You know, I mean, I've never, I, I remember, you know, in the early years, you know, when I'd win more tournaments, not as much anymore, but when I'd win them, <laughs> I wouldn't even think about it more than a day. And then I was on to the next one in my mind, you know, yeah. thinking about the next, I'd be thinking about the next one while I was fishing that one. No and, kidding. you know, so I don't know, it's just an addiction. Um, much like gambling, uh, cocaine, <laughs> drugs, you know, uh, alcohol. I mean, it's, you guys know. No, yeah, can't get, can't get enough. Eh? Uh -oh. We know. Yeah, I mean, can't get I'd enough. Go, yeah, I'd rather go fish a tournament than than do any uh, any fun fishing. But you know what? I love fun fishing. Don't get me wrong. I, I like going 
fishing for walleyes and crappies and you know pike and muskie and bluegill everything you know but yeah. i i've done it so much for the tv show you know probably just under a thousand episodes we shot right and uh and you know we fished everything and i was so lucky to fish with so many good anglers that that's the part i will miss but i won't because i'm still fishing with a ton of good anglers all the time it's it's constant you know uh but I was exposed to so many good anglers that, you know, the things you'd learn just when you thought you were good at something, you'd go with somebody that was better than you at that type of technique. And you go, wow, this, this person takes it to another level. And you go, I thought I was pretty good at that. And then now I was like a rookie compared to them, you know, fishing current or, or uh, throwing a jerk bait or, or crank baiting or whatever it is, you know, just didn't matter is I always, always, met guys that were better than me and gals that were better than me in specific techniques. And I know that is something that as anglers, we all want to keep improving, right? Cause you know, you're never done learning. So anyway, that was, uh, that was neat though. I mean, I, I, as I said, been there, done that. And now I want to do more of what I want to do. And that's just fish, 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 you know, and no cameras <laughs> all the time on my backside. Yeah. Gussie and Bruce, speaking of good snakes, these are, arguably or probably they are the best snakes locally here in the central Canada. And uh, you've had a big impact and you know, both of those guys there. Uh, that's awesome stuff. And Cooper Gallant, you said, you know him, he's uh Johnston brothers, yeah. you name it. So you know, all these guys. And I talk to all those kids, uh, you know, probably about every week, one of them will call me at a different time, whether traveling in between tournaments and we'll shoot the breeze and Gussie, you know, is in there and, and Chris, Corey, uh, Cooper. And I talk to all of them on a pretty regular basis. Uh, you know, intermittently, you know, you know, sometimes it'll go a month when I don't talk to one of them. Then I'll, the next week I'm talking to the other one. And funny how Chris and Corey are, I'll talk to one of them and then I don't hear from the other one for two weeks. And all of a sudden I hear from him out of the blue, you know, and I'm getting the scoop on how that tournament went or what they did right, what they did wrong. And and I just thrive on hearing that information. I just, uh, it's, it feels like you were there just because I know some of the lakes that they're competing on in the u.s some of my fished in in you know my career and stuff and and i know how hard it is and what they're going through and then what they're missing at home too because you know the biggest thing i hear from you know uh chris and Corey is they they hate to miss their kids when they're gone for so long especially when it's back to back to back tournaments and they're gone for like three or four weeks or or more and i tell them you know my only regret is when I was doing what I was doing in those early years when my daughter and son were really young, I missed their growing up. I would see them for like a day, yeah, maybe right. every week. or ha But I wouldn't be home all day. I'd only be home for a little bit because I'd have to go to the office and check in or work on boats or unpack and pack because I was gone for another week or two. And then I'd be home for a day and that. So I saw them grow up in increments. You know, it seemed like every time I come home, they're an inch taller and that. And I said, that was, you know, probably one of my only regrets, you know, of this whole business is, is I had to keep busy to build the the company, the brand and all that other junk that comes with it. And, and, you know, that's just a commitment. I think a lot of people in life make that are on the road, they realize that, you know, the sacrifices are, you don't see your family much and, uh, you know, you know, knock on wood, I got a great relationship with my kids and my wife and family and extended family and everything. But, but I do look back at it and it was, uh, it was a lot of traveling, you know, and uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I know I averaged 300 days for at least 30 some odd years, you know, and uh, that was, that was fun, but you know, you in to fish at some of those places I fished, you know, where you're catching like, you know, you're trying to shake off, you know, 10, 12 pound pike because you're trying to get 20 pound pike, you know, and it's like, yeah. how spoiled is that? Or you're catching, you know, five and six pound walleyes, but you're really hoping to get some double digit walleyes. So those are disappointment and your expectations <laughs> get a little crazy too. Yeah. And then you go back to fishing a tournament and you get your ass kicked and then you're all back to being humble <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what that's what i like about tournament fishing it puts you in your place real quick you can have incredible highs as you guys all know and life is good and you know you you think you won a lottery and then the next tournament you go you just you're you're doing terrible and you go 
it's like you're at the bottom of the barrel now, you know, and, and that's what I kind of like about it. I, I don't like the lows that much. They, they kind of, you know, are crappy, but I do like the highs of it. And every now and then, you know, you get one and you remember what it feels like. The hardest thing is, though, is these young guys now. And, you know, it, it, it could be, you know, Cooper and Gussie and Chris and Corey and all these. And there's so many good anglers up in your part of the world. You know, in Manitoba, northwestern Ontario, and out in Saskatchewan, and that. And no matter where you go, the average angler is so much better right now. The average. So when I started in the '80s, it was so easy to to win tournaments back then. My brother Wayne and I in team turns, we'd be pissed if we didn't win every tournament we fished. And I, I don't. Together, we might have won maybe fifty team tournaments together. I don't know. And then singles i mean i remember him winning the canadian open in 92 and 93 and he won a ranger boat those years then 94 95 96 i won it and won a rangers in those years and then in the middle year i won the classic too and uh kingston won a ranger and a chevy truck and you know you go like those were the good old days you know where you just were upset if you didn't win everything and you know fast forward to now and i'm lucky i'm happy to be in the top 50 yeah, exactly. that's how that's how we feel. <laughs> Top fifty, yes, we're winning. Do you, do you think it's do you think it's more uh, more the equipment that people are using nowadays that are making them better? I, I think you know, it's like, a lot of reasons. I, I do, but I believe getting on the internet, learning is so much easier now than it was in those early years. You had to get out and either be taught by somebody yeah. or learn it yourself. There was, that was really the only two ways to do it in the early years. Um, and yeah, yeah, you'd pick up some stuff off TV shows and magazines for sure. I'm not, I can't put down the traditional media that I, I did for over three decades. But, but the fact is that, you know, you would, you would learn mostly by trial and error and time on the water. There are tournament anglers now, good young guys that don't know some of the basics of fishing but they know the basics of forward view, like active target that Lorenz has. They know how to use that to like, you know, to a T. They're looking at that screen and all of a sudden they're panning their electric motor over and, you know, it doesn't matter what they're using. They might be using, let's say, the Lorenz Ghost and they all of a sudden see a fish that's 50 feet out that's at one o'clock and bang, they throw a cast out there and catch that fish. There's guys like on the Renegade circuit that I fish and a number of other circuits that I fish that are young that don't know the the basic old school way of fishing. This is what they know and they know how to do it good. And so there is a fast track out there with electronics and equipment. But I also think time on the water and in learning some of the ABCs of fishing are worth their weight in gold too but it's it's one of these juggling acts nowadays in competitive fishing because you got to know how to use forward facing sonar like an active target and you've got to know the basics and the two of them are going to make you a consistent angler because if you get too hung up on one thing and you miss the other thing which could be you know somebody throwing a topwater lure you know over a flat or something catching fish and yeah. And, you know, you spent your time looking for suspended fish out there, the pelagic fish chasing bait or something. Um, and, you know, maybe you caught enough to be halfway down the pack, but you weren't up in that top half or top 20% or whatever that might get a check. So it's a, it's a balancing act. And it's a tough one because a lot of the old school anglers like me that are not quite as good at using some of the newer electronics as the young people, we got to push some of the old school stuff back and get with the new wave and that's fishing electronics to the nth degree you know and just keeping an eye on a couple of units and looking you know below you and out front and and all that and and really covering the water column and 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 it's it's interesting i love it still i mean i'm not there's no complaining i'm just i'm just thinking this is a cool challenge moving forward because if you're not adept at pretty well a little bit of this and a little bit of that and 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 that you're not you're not gonna catch too many chats yeah well, you, were, yeah. Nick, you were telling us that you were you started back when it was like paper graphs like you're like you you're flipping the paper upside down to get it to read like that's how 
you were at the beginning of all this electronic stuff. You've seen it all progress to what it is now. Like, how were you winning tournaments back in the day? Like, it was just all just pure fishing kind of basics. Yeah, and, and flashers too. Like, mm. Lorenz had the green box, and then after that, they had you know flashers that were mounted on on the mounts right in your boat, and then and you know other companies. Humbird had a, a a flasher as well, and and then Vexler I think had a flasher and. And so these companies that have flashers, that was kind of the first round of electronics. Then the next round was paper graphs. And then the LCD graphs came out that were electronic, you know, pixels and things like that. But um, a lot of it was idling around with your, your, your you know, with a, just a traditional sonar flasher looking for bottom changes you know you're looking for deep weeds you're looking for breaks and drop offs humps saddles you know points whatever and you're you know other than graphing them you're just going around and you're seeing your your line going up and down up and down then every now and then you'd mark some fish that were suspended too you know so but you never knew what those fish were because you'd have to be really good at it you know figure out the wide bands and the the you know the different band widths and stuff like that for different species and sizes of fish but uh another thing that you know we don't hardly use anymore are paper charts and out in the garage there's you know boxes and boxes containers of paper charts from my tournament fishing right i i bet you there's you know oh uh oh oh did there you, you go did you freeze for you guys online yeah, and you know oh, there start looking we lost you for a second, Bob. Are you back? <laughs> uh -oh. Research and before there I even is. get to the lake, so. I think people are on this. This is just a recording. We're just pretending to interact with Bob. We scripted all of this already. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, there's just some, some connection stuff here. But that's yeah. that's old school or whatever. And now with the forward face, do you use it a lot? Like, like have you come on board with yeah, this? Yeah, I don't claim to be real good at it yet. If I'm not good at it by the end of the season, I'm going to be very surprised at myself. Yeah. You know, because I know I can get better at it. Um, the biggest thing is deciphering, you know, what you're looking at is for me has been the ch most challenging part of it, you know, and, and the size of the fish and, you know, the guys that are really good at it are telling me stuff that I'm going, really? You know, like you can do that. You can tell the size of it. You can tell the difference between a six pounder and a three pounder, you know, and all that stuff. And that's pretty cool of, you know, how uh, much detail some of the guys are getting. So my goal this year is I am going to get a lot better at it or I might as well not fish tournaments anymore. You know, I mean, that's yeah. the bottom line is that if, if I don't, I'm going to be a donator for the rest of my life. And I don't want to do that. I mean, I, I, it's uh, not a bad place to be, you know, a donator. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you get used to it. You get used to it. Trust me. <laughs> no, no. no it, it, on the boat too. We got to do it. There is a time for charity fishing, but that's, you know, that's a different, you know, taking kids out and doing those type of functions, but not, not in tournaments where people are trying to win the, win the big box. You don't want to be a donator, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty cool though. It's, it's, you know, the big debate is who's got the best one, you know, and it depends who you ask because you get a lot of biased um, information. Like if some guy started out with one brand in their mind, that's the best. You know, Lorenz came out a little bit later uh, with Active Target. And um, at first, everybody's saying, oh, the original guys are better. I'm hearing a lot of good things about Lorenz Active Target in terms of comparing it to their competitors out there. And, uh, you know, from very good anglers, I'm hearing very favorable comments that lean towards Lorenz. But I'm sure there's guys that are, you know, sponsored or are bought, have bought the other units and are having very good success with them. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, comparing Ford to Chevy. I mean, some people like GM and some people like Ford, you know, and so it gets to be a personal preference because a lot of these companies now, they better make a decent product because it's a competitive world out there. And, and with social media and, you know, people talking just like we're talking right now, I mean, everybody's got um an opinion but you can certainly do a lot of research real quick on the internet 
and find out that, you know, if you take you know, 30 opinions and 20 of them are this way and 10 of them are this way, well, you can maybe base your opinion on, oh, uh, then that one's a little bit more popular or whatever. But then then you got to, you know, start remembering who is writing these things and how good are they and, you know, are they, uh, you know, are they, if they're tournament anglers, are, are they winning or are they doing this or that? And, and then, of course, I like the comparisons, too, that you see on the Internet where guys will take, you know, two or three units and compare them, you know, against each other and that. It's uh, it's pretty good. But I, I will say that, the you know, I just spent some time at that World's Fishing Fair down in Springfield, Missouri, and, and uh, you know, they had all the, the electronics companies there. And so I was, you know, I, I did do a little research on my own, just checking out all the simulating modes of everybody's units while i was there and and oh well, yeah there's some pictures there's you know yeah. it's so funny there's roland martin bill dance and of course johnny morris from bass pro shots I'm, i talked a lot to roland and jimmy and bill who i've known since like the early 80s like like 1980 81 82 so i met all those guys those guys are still doing their show and they're in their 80s not that crazy yeah, it's funny. And I was, I said, when are you guys going to quit? And they said, quit? No, we're never going to. And I was laughing. And then fun. Hank Parker and I had supper one night. And Hank, he retired from tournament fishing at 38. And he's older than I am by about, I think he's about five years older than me. And he retired from tournament fishing at 38 to pursue his TV career and some other things. I think he raced uh, in one of the NASCAR type series and stuff for a bit and stuff. But, uh, yeah, he says he doesn't miss the tournaments, you know, and that uh, too much. He uh, he likes what he does and and stuff. And I told him what I was doing. I think I surprised him. I think they were all surprised when I told him I wound down the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is, you know. So is, is there well, a show that you remember, but like that stands out for you vividly? Like out, out of all the shows you've done, is there one that just really stands out? And you just say, I, I love, I loved it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the ones that stood out the most. Yeah. And you guys are going to go, what? That I got done quick. So we'd like literally get out on the water and to get that, the half hour of footage, which is really only 22 minutes and 50 seconds of footage be between the intro of the show and the commercial breaks, the three, um, um, what are they, two minute breaks in there. Um, so there's, you know, 12, 30 second commercials and a half hour TV show. So the ones I remember the most that were most gratifying is we get the boat launch, we go and, and we, you know, fish a hump for walleyes or smallmouth or whatever. And it was boom, 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 boom. And then like 45 minutes, we said, what are we going to do now? Because we got enough fish for the show and we got some big yeah. ones, lots of action. And only a half of them are going to make it in the show. And it's less than an hour and we were done everything that we needed to do. And so at that point, if like, and that's probably where it was changing for me too a bit is I wasn't smelling the roses on a lot of the trips in the, the latter years. So we'd drive up to like Kenora, for instance, or, you know, Menaki or something and, you know, 20 some odd hours from down where I live, drive up there. We might drive for, um, 15 hours the first day, get a hotel room somewhere in Minnesota or way up, you know, somewhere in the U.S. if we're cutting through the U.S. Get up there, film till dark that night for a couple hours, film the next day. All of a sudden we go, we got the show done. We got yeah. the interviews done. We got shots of the lodge that we were at. We got, uh, we got our fish. Let's go. And we just drive right back, 20 some odd hours back. And a lot of people say, well, why didn't you just fun fish? But the thing is, in my situation, if I get back early, I can go practice for another tournament a little bit. <laughs> tournament, always back to yeah, tournament. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, let's go. And yeah. we just turn around and come right back. And, you know, as much as it was really cool to do that when I was younger, it wasn't as exactly like a cakewalk, you know, you know, when you're, you know, 60 years old or 62 or whatever, that you're driving, you know. 20 some odd hours shooting for a day and a half straight and then just drive straight back. And I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying, no, that's how we did it. Because yeah. so my most memorable, sh memorable shoots, probably personally, even though they're a little bit different than I know what you thought I was going to say is because 
they were gratifying for me just to get big fish, get them quick, get the heck out of there and move on to the next one. Cause it wasn't like I wasn't going fishing again. As soon as I got back, I changed boats, grabbed my tournament boat and I was gone to a tournament to go free fish for an extra <laughs> yeah. two days instead of being on location, catching fish that really didn't matter to me because I really wanted to do well in the tournament that I was going to. And I it put me there earlier. So yeah. So what do we got going? Tournaments, eh? I have another tournament this week. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife, Divine, asked me if you're still married. Like, 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 because she hates it when like I did 20 tournaments a year one time and she hated it so much. Oh, my wife is the most supporting uh, wife. I all my friends that know her well, they say the only reason they're friends with me is because they like her. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that makes me feel. <laughs> Important, but not as important as her, okay? <laughs> uh, no. Um, the funny thing is, is she's a competitive person. And she understands it. She fishes. Um, you know, she she knows it. And she used to, you know, really push me when I wouldn't do well in tournaments. And, um, you know, she understands it. And she knows the highs and lows. But always supportive and always says, go. Oh, oh, signal again. <laughs> Is she really supportive? Do you hear that device? She's supportive. <laughs> I've lost you. You're back. You're, You're back. back again. You're back. You're back. In the dark yes. on me. Um, <laughs> so what happened is I played like 30 rounds of golf. And I'm still a crappy golfer. I'm probably, you know, like a, a good round from me is like I'm in that low 90s every now and then break 90s. So I'm like an 18 handicap probably in that range you know uh give or take uh well no more ad okay probably you know so she looked at me and that was a year i didn't cash a lot of checks in terms i cashed a few but i didn't make much money in them and i used to always like making a profit every year tournament fishing for gosh at least 25 years straight i always made money tournament fishing and all the expenses were paid by my winnings plus i'd make a lift on it in some years, better lifts than others. And uh, she said, do you think you ever win any money golfing? I said, no, I'm a hack. I mean, everybody I golf with, they're really good golfers. So I'm out there. I'm always the crappiest golfer in a foursome with all these guys I play at these clubs around here and stuff. Or I did that year. She goes, well, that answers your question. Or that answers why you did poor insurance. <laughs> You're too, too much on the golf course, you know? And, and she was right. That one year I was dumb being out on the golf course, even though I love playing it, is yeah. because um, I didn't win much in tournament fishing. And, and you know, what lesson learned? All those, all those, you know, four hours, four hour, four and a half hour rounds of golf, I, I could have been on lake somewhere honing my skills <laughs> instead of, <laughs> you know, butchering it. And there's Darren. Yeah, that was. Uh, oh, Darren, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, I think, the year. Yeah, we won that one. The Qu That was the last one we won together, uh, um, the Quinny uh, Cup in uh, Trenton. And uh, that was pretty That was pretty cool because the year, the years prior to that in the Quinny Cup, which is in Trenton on Bay Quinny, and it's great largemouth fishery and great walleye fishery too. But anyway, we got um, a fourth, no, a fifth, a fourth, and a third in that order in the years prior to that picture you just showed of him and I winning. So um, leading up to that turn, I joked to a number of people just, you know, tongue in cheek. And I said, and I, I don't know, you know, and, and I think tournament fishing, you have to be confident, but just a thread of cockiness in there too sometimes. And so I was just fun, having fun with friends. I said, we're going to skip second this year. We've got all the other finishes top five. We're just going to jump to first. And and then we win that one. And so, so it was pretty cool. You know, it was neat to win it. And him and I have won about, I don't know, three or four tournaments together. And it's always fun to win one with your son, you know. So yeah. that was pretty neat. But that was the last one I won. That was like three years ago, I think. So I'm I'm ready. Nice. I got to get this. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people don't know it. I won my first Bass Tournament 77. I think it was. Yeah, 77. And so I've won tournaments, like, out of the 70-some-odd tournaments I've won. I won them in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and then in the 2020. Yeah, that was 20. So it's how many decades that again? I just lost my fingers. Anyway, I think it's... 
six decades. I've won yeah. them in now. And I'd like to make it to seven. I don't friggin' know if I'll live that long, though. But if I could, that'd be pretty cool. But I want to win a bunch more in this decade here in the, you know, 20, yeah. uh, 20 to 2030, I guess. But uh, um, I don't know. You know what? It And I tell people this. And I, I'm going on about tournaments a lot, guys. But it's nothing more than self-gratification. Because at the end of the day, if you're not talking to fanatical tournament anglers, and you're talking to people that fish that don't fish turns. If you're second, third, 30th, 50th, it means nothing to them unless you want it, right? Right. It's, exactly. it's funny. <laughs> yeah, like you can place really high in a tournament, be really proud of yourself and go, what a what an event. You know, I beat a uh, hundred other boats and I got fifth place. And they go, That's all you got fifth, <laughs> you know. And it's like, okay. <laughs> So do you ever fish any tournaments with your daughter? Uh, well, now your daughter. So, a lot of people think Mariko is my daughter, right? And so Mariko is my Mariko. niece. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Wayne's daughter. Then my my daughter Kristen. No, her and I have never fished a tournament together, and I don't know if she'd be able to put up with me in the boat because then <laughs> there's a pirate in the team tournaments. My son would tell you that. You know, he uh. He sees it. I, you know, and, and, you know, when I get down to uh, Sturgeon Bay with Derek Strube, who I fished with, it, I think 10 years, we've done that tournament together. We haven't done it the last couple of years of COVID, but this year we're going back. So it's kind of weird because you got two guys that think they're captains in the boat and we're fighting for the foot paddle and, you know, he'll say, <laughs> okay, I, I'm just going to fish out deep a bit here and then you do your shallow stuff. And then when it's my turn to run the electric, I go deep. And he goes, I thought we were going to go shallow. He says, you like fishing shallow. I said, no, nah, it's my turn. I'll just do what I want to do. <laughs> but really, I want to go shallow. But I just toy with him a bit. <laughs> so you should see us in the front of the boat. It's like uh, we're always trying to put our foot on the pedal. Sometimes I think his foot's on top of mine or mine's on his, you know, when we're running it. But I think with my daughter, I don't know if she'd be able to take the orders because I get, I get wired in tournaments. I really do. I mean, I'm kind of mellow right now, but in tournaments, I get friggin' wired to the point of uh, not spun out, just, just you know, a little bit, a little bit sort of like this, you know. And it's like, <laughs> do this, do that. It's like, what? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think they, you know, people want to take orders, and so I guess that's the other side of me you guys aren't seeing. But uh, <laughs> we know yeah, that's that's good, I was gonna say. <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. a sign that we don't see on the show. Yeah. I love my daughter too much yeah. to fish a tournament with her. My wife and I fished a, uh, one or two turns together in, in our dating years. Yeah. I think there's a reason she doesn't fish any <laughs> team. <laughs> She's still married. I think we're lost She's still she married fishing. though, right? <laughs> no, oh, yeah. No, no. She's just very competitive. Very competitive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think with me, you know, saying do this, do that, I, I think she just likes she knows what she's doing. She's actually made a lot better decisions on the water uh at times than I have because she'd do all the still photography, right? So she's got all these fancy cameras to do the still shots for the magazine and stuff while we're doing. So, you know, for the last probably decade or 12 years, you know, she would take all those photos are hers, like of Wayne and myself there. Those are all her photos. And and uh so she would, you know, we'd be out there fishing and she'd say, Bob, why don't you put a crankbait on? Say, They're not going to hit a crankbait, blah, blah, blah. She says, just try this bait, you know, and she'd grab like a lipless crankbait. And next thing you know, I got a nine pound walleye and it's like the biggest fish of the the, the outing. And it's like, you know, and she's just got that look on, on her face, happy. <laughs> but I know that look. Yeah. And that look is, why didn't you listen to me? We could have got this show done three hours ago instead <laughs> of you dragging a jig all over, over all over the place, you know. And it's so funny because her intuition, and that's what I like about angling is, you know, you take the four of us, for instance. We could be on the same body of water fishing for the same species doing four different things, all having some sort of success. But one of us is probably going to be having better success because either you've refined the technique, even though two of you might be doing the same thing, you've refined it better, or or you might have a technique that's different than the other three on the on this, you know, screen right now, right? So it, you know, there's never a right or a wrong answer. I mean, there is a wrong answer, but there's usually several rights. If you take any 
fishing tournament and you interview the top five, usually you get three different things between those top five that are being done, you know, predominantly. So that's what I like. But my, my wife's pretty good angling too. She catches them. Like when the camera's off, she's chunking and winding things that I would never dream of using and she's catching them. And I got lots of stories about that. You guys, you guys are familiar with the, the lipless, uh, uh, vibrating or the vibrating jigs, you know, the, uh, the original, um, uh, Z man, uh, chatter bait for instance. Right. Yeah. So there was one out of Japan called an OSP, uh, blade jig. It had a clear blade and it was Japanese or similar to the chatter, but we're on Lake Erie one day and my son, her and I, and she said, why don't you throw the blade jig? I said, almost don't eat those things. And so anyway, she says, do you have one? I, I'd like to throw one. So I grabbed a big casting outfit on, tied one on for it, gave it to her. I said, it's not going to work. And in about 15 minutes, she had a five and a four and a three and a half. Small mouth, crystal clear water, four feet of water, making long bomb cast, catching these small mouth on a reaction bait. Well, I'm dragging a tube and a drop shot and all the traditional things. You know, this is probably about uh, seven, eight years ago, maybe. And to this day, I have never said to her they won't eat a specific bait when she asked me for one, right? <laughs> she schooled me. In 15 minutes, she had three fish that were bigger than anything I'd caught in a few hours of fishing. So there you go. That's my that's my that's my wifey story, but that's the only one I'm telling you because I don't want myself to look too bad. I mean, I don't want to look too browbeaten. <laughs> So okay, it happens to all of us. Our wives always tell us to use something else, and it always works. <laughs> it does. Isn't that true oh, enough? Really right. We got a saying out here, though, when uh, you always got to be careful when someone retires, like a good stick, and when they retire, look out. And there's some good sticks there that have retired, and now they got, they got more time to practice and, and really hone in on it. And, and Bob Zumi is retired now kind of thing. That's it, man. Look, look Watch out, out everybody. With, yeah. with active target yet? Oh, my God. Here we go. Here we I, go. I think it's going to be fun. You know, I really do. I just, I, I, I want to, you know, I, it, it to me, when I'm at the, the way in line and I look at the tank and there's, you know, 10 or 12 other people at the tank waiting to weigh in with me. And I start looking at everybody's age and I go, there's not a lot of old guys here anymore. They're all young, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and to me, that even keeps me going more, you know, I just like it. You know, I, 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 I know that they're, those guys are going to be more agile than me. They're going to be out probably earlier than me and out later than me. Although I still like fish until dark, but I don't get up at, I don't get on the water at sunrise. Like some of them do, you know, yeah. some of these guys want to be at the ramp, the first one at the ramp. And you always can tell because their truck is right by the ramp in the best parking spot. And you go, how'd they get that? And then I'll talk to them and they'll say, Oh, we were here an hour before dark uh, or an hour into the dark waiting. I'm like what? I wasn't even up then. I was had my alarm set <laughs> for like, you know, when the sun's up and a pot of coffee on, you know, and I figure the fish don't know what time it is. But you know what? They the a lot of the young guys will out practice you. And I used to do that when I was younger too. I mean, sun up to sundown every day, you know, and I'll still do some of those days. Yeah, but not as many as I used to. You're in the dark. You know yeah. that guy. You know that guy that's with me there? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Carol's been in the show, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a piece of work. We're, we're having uh, <laughs> breakfast one day. We met him for breakfast. My wife and son and I met him in Mississauga at this pancake place for breakfast. And I'm up paying as we're leaving. There's people all over. And he starts telling me about his day of fishing a couple of days before. But he starts setting the hook and making noises, fighting fish. And I'm just trying to crawl under the cash register to get out of there and pay and get out of the. I mean, he was so animated in this restaurant talking about this day on the water he had, like he had drags going and hook sets going, and and I, everybody must have thought he was having some sort of uh, you know problem digesting his food or something. <laughs> He's definitely what. Well, another time we're in a marina, we're we're catching these great big chinook salmon. In, in the early fall, and they were running into this marina, you know, spawn time. He's talking away to me. He's just wiring. We're firing, you know, in some of the open areas between the boats and that. He fired a jerk bait right into a guy's door into a sailboat. And the guy's working on the sailboat in the front. 
and he fired it right through the main door in the back, right into the guy's living room. A jerk bait. And I'm like, this is not going to end well. And I hope the guy doesn't know who I am or recognize me. And I don't know how he got it out of there, but he finessed it out of the cabin that right through the door. I mean, like, you know, past the back deck, right through the door into it. And I don't know how he finessed it back without that guy seeing him. You know, I'm just thinking, please, I hope it didn't catch his couch or his leather chair (laughs) or or whatever in there, lazy boy or something. But oh, yeah, I, you know, I he just did one of these. He's talking, he just fires his casting rod like this, and then he goes, Whoops, yeah, (laughs) you probably see the the food on the table. (laughs) You could have snagged the guy's steak or something, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, quick, quick questions, there. quick questions there, Bob. Like uh, rapid fire, rapid fire. We just got the questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, craziest, your craziest tournament partner or favorite? Cra- favorite. Craziest tournament partner. Uh, craziest, craziest. Well, I don't know. I mean, my son Darren. Um, <laughs> so just you know, when the big iPhones came out, the expensive ones a few years back. Um, so he he's fighting a, a small mouth. It's like a four and a half, five pound fish. Pretty good one. We need it. And uh, it's in Lake Ontario. And he's put one foot on the gunnel. And he's fighting, fighting, leaning. And all of a sudden he slips and he falls in the water. And he's still fighting the fish. So he hands me the rod. I bring it in. Then before I pull him in the boat, after I throw the, of course, got to put the fish in live well, put the fish in live well, I go to pull him out and he reaches in his pocket, grabs this brand new iPhone that he got for like a thousand dollars or whatever. And he, and, uh, he throws it, um, up on the seat or into the boat. And then I get him in the boat. And then when he gets in the boat, he picks up his phone and he's, you know, kind of disgusted. And I don't know if it was working, probably still working. To, and he just sort of lightly chucks it on the, the seat and it boing and right into the lake and down in the <laughs> deep water. It's gone. So he had an iPhone, retrieved it out of his pocket, put it in the boat, and then lightly threw it. I mean, the throw was like two feet or a foot and a half. He just lightly chucked it. And it hit and just bounced out like a basketball. And I mean, you know, that was that was kind of funny at the time, although it wasn't. And then last year we're fishing together on Lake Erie. It's the end of November. It's like five footers out there. And it was like glass. 20 minutes into it, it's fo- five footers. And I said to him and his girlfriend, I said, we're not quitting until we catch 10 fish. And, and I get one, uh, like, it, I said, okay, weigh it. And I'm holding a troller motor. We're up and down, up and down these five footers. He's in the back of the boat with the Berkeley skills. And he's doing this. He goes, nah, 615. I say, okay, you can chuck it back. So I've not broke seven yet ever in my life. So anyway, a couple days later. Uh, oh, so later that day, I, I said to him, I said something about uh, something uh, about uh, text or something. And he said, oh, I lost my phone an hour ago. I said, what? Oh, yeah, when I was just leaning over the boat there, bringing in one of my fish, just grabbing it, it fell out of my jacket pocket. I lost him. We are in like 35 feet of water. He said, so I, like, I didn't even God. tell you because there's nothing <laughs> I can do about it. But anyway, he lost that phone. So a few days later, I asked him, I said, the scale, was it bouncing around? He goes, yeah, it was bouncing around. Like, um, you know, it would bounce around to like 614 to like 74. So I gave you six fifteen. I said what? I gave you. <laughs> I said I never broke seven. And at the Canadian Open in Kingston a few years back, like about eight years ago, he weighed in a seven point three zero in the tournament, and so he's caught a seven. I've never caught one. I've caught probably five or six six fifteens, and you know numerous others in the high teens, but never a seven. So. I said, are you serious? I still don't count as seven, but I, I do know in my heart it might have been. <laughs> it counts. Good chats. That counts. How about this yeah. one there, Kalma? Do you, like his favorite show was uh, with you with Kronzi uh, there. Uh, do you keep in contact with him or any other Canadian show hosts? 
I, I never did a show with Daryl Cruns. Oh, you, you never did. Well, you watched him there, Derek Kalama. <laughs> now, my, somebody brother, else. <laughs> my brother Wayne gets together with Daryl about once every year or two years, and they drink excessive amounts of beer together, talk <laughs> about the business. Now, Daryl retired from his show um, several years ago. He, he uh, pulled the plug on it. Uh, but I have never uh, fished with him. I remember for Ontario Tourism... Uh, I was with him and some other fishing show hosts, and we were all up at uh, at a resort in northern Ontario to do a commercial together, all of us together uh, for a for a tourism commercial. But I've never never fished with him. But uh, um, wait, about, I did do a him? show with him. You're oh, right. No, no, no. <laughs> there, 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 that, that was five. That, that was four five. No, I did do a sh- <laughs> I did do a show with him. You're right. <laughs> See, thinking about tournament, that's why. There's another story, but I can't tell it on this podcast. Okay, <laughs> there's another story about Wayne and him, but that's not yeah. for family listening. Um, uh, but anyway, I did do with with Gord years ago, uh, or not Gord, sorry, with uh, Daryl years ago. We did do one show, but see, he used to throw me under the bus on his show. I don't know. I never saw these episodes, <laughs> but I'd have guys phoning me. Wanting to kill Daryl, like back <laughs> 20 years ago. And one instance was John Vanderveer. John and I won a bunch of tournaments together, and he passed away of cancer a number of years ago. But John and I uh, were dear friends and tournament partners. Uh, we fished the KBI together, and we won uh, oh the the uh, Swaba Classic, won a javelin bass boat in that one, and and uh, we won a bunch of them together. So anyway. He, he's watching Kronzi's show one day, and Kronzi said, yeah, if you ever see Bob Azumi or any of these guys in their bass boats coming around your dock to fish, keep a bucket of rocks there and throw rocks at them. <laughs> and he was doing this on his show, saying stuff like this, right? And then another show he did, he said uh, something like, and this is all hearsay. If Daryl's watching and it's not true, I don't hold it against you if it's true or not true, Daryl, because I don't care. I mean, I don't care what people say or anything. That's one thing about me. My my ego is a little different. It's, it's you know, it doesn't matter. You can't hurt my feelings. I mean, I just, uh, the only thing that hurt my feelings are lost fish. That's it. But not, not, not anything anybody says or does. Another show, I remember he, I think he said he, he was catching bass and he said, oh, if I ever got a good recipe for bass. It's Bob Azumi's favorite recipe. <laughs> and he knows I fish tournaments, catch and release. And I would never kill a bass to eat because I like eating other species of fish. Wow. So I'm sure that was a little dig from, from him. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, there you go. Sale. That's in your backyard there, Bob, at Foodie World in Toronto. <laughs> hey, well, I'm going to have to go there and stock up for my next tournament. <laughs> <laughs> $14.99 a pound. Oh, there you go. Go. oh yeah, nice. Yeah, fast name on the Google. That's fast Google right there, bro. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys are on the ball, man. You're finding stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you just have like a library of this stuff just, at your head. Ready to go. You say something. Just save it. Over. Yeah. <laughs> well, gosh, I better you better keep this really family oriented. Then I might say something that you're going to put up there that you're going to regret on your last show here tonight. Why, why would you start? We don't keep it. I know. Oh my God. You, you started with cocaine. You said cocaine earlier. That's it. That's yeah, it. you started. Yeah. Well, we're we're taking an object to Sturgeon Bay called a flogger. You guys know Ooh, what those yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, don't Google that though, okay? No. <laughs> I've heard stories of people Googling flogger. Don't, don't, go- <laughs> don't yeah, do it. It's not going to take you to a tackle uh, site to buy them, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and try looking through the water with one of those types. You're not going to see much, but anyway, um, no, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting business, though. I mean. Uh, um, Many of the guys that have TV shows now, I've done shows with them in the early years before they started there. So I always get a kick out of it, you know, and there's so many of them that um, I, I don't know if I helped start them, but I certainly, uh, you know, showed them how we shot a show and and then they would start. And, you know, to me, hey, more power to them, you know. Um, so, yeah, but Kronzi, he was already doing his show when, when I shot that deal with him. It actually... Hold on now. I got to think about this. Oh, here we go. 
<laughs> Look what you started, Derek, man. He's, he's on this Derek Kronz. Or whatever, not you Derek, can't forget about him now, man. It may, been, it may have been Wayne. That I, so I did almost a thousand shows. I can't remember every freaking one of them. And because yeah. I just, you asked me about any tournament I fished in the last 45 years, I can tell you the weight, the time I caught a fish, <laughs> what tree it was, what the, but don't ask the shows because they were just, you know, that was work. I mean, tournaments were, but it might have been Wayne that shot it with them. It might have been him and Wayne now that I think of it. I don't know. Wayne would do the controversial <laughs> shows. I was always the clean one doing the, you know, the shows with, uh, you know, the the guys that weren't as, it weren't like Daryl that was controversial. But <laughs> you know what? I, I always liked him because the things he was entertaining when I would, when you'd talk to him off camera and you'd see him, you know, wherever at a sports show or at a bar or whatever, yeah. you, you know, he was just, he was definitely wired different. And that's what I always liked about him is stuff that would come out of his mouth and the conspiracies and the, the this and that. And he wasn't afraid to put <laughs> on anybody or anything or any, you know, the government or anything. And we had that campfire at the end of the shows. He always had that campfire and you'd be like, oh, yeah. you got to yeah. get it for Mike, man. You got to get like this little campfire for Mike. <laughs> and let him go off. Yeah. Right. So you, that's you, a soapbox, uh, man. you said you you remember all your tournaments. What's your most memorable tournament? Well, um, I I don't know because you know there was so many. Like I remember one of the turns. It might have been the, either the OV Pro Bass Classic in '95, where um, I was the last to weigh in, and the the, the local Harley dealership uh, brought a brand new Harley there, and I sat on the back, put my bass in the bag in a in their uh, saddle bag on the back of the uh, Harley, and I was on the back of the Harley getting motored up in back then we'd have like like there'd be over a thousand people to weigh in and it was a big deal in those early years and i remember riding up to the stage on the back of a harley putting the fish on live well and... oh oh stop again. again you'll be back again you'll be yeah, back I'm not sure because i'd won a few of them in <laughs> kingston the same year but those things were neat and then um catching fish that in the last few minutes of the yeah. tournament and then like john vanderveer the guy died of cancer very memorable tournament where well, rondo bay it's the bay i grew up fishing on but then i started um in southwestern cool he'll be back so I was traveling <laughs> all over and i didn't live there i lived you know two and a half hours from there i was traveling all over the darn world fishing and filming and fishing other tournaments and the classic for the swab of the Southwestern Ontario Bass Association tournament that year was on Rondo Bay. So John and I blew out the first day, the first tournament. And this is in my old stomping grounds at Lake St. Clair, the first qualifier. A buddy of mine was there that I grew up with him and his wife to watch away at. And he said, I can't believe some lady that was uh, beside me. This is like, this is around 1990 or so, or 89 or something. And, uh, um, so the show had been airing for, you know, six, seven years and, and we had a, we had found the winning fish, but the West wind came in and blew that water out and made it muddy. And we stuck with it too long and we didn't do well in that term. And this lady says to somebody, she's with, looks good on him. Big TV star can't even catch any fish, you know? <laughs> and I mean, we caught a limit, but they weren't big, you know, in each day of the multi-day tournament, two-day tournament. So next tournament's down at Long Point. And we got big fish and we won that turn. Then the next qualifier for that series is back at Lake St. Clair. And we won that one on that same spot. We found two tournaments back. It cleared up. And in that tournament, in the last uh, couple of minutes of fishing, um, John, uh, I hooked a small fish, like just a small, small, small but there were three others following it. And uh, you could see them all and they were all bigger. And I said, John, throw out there, throw out there. And he's really flustered. And I said, here. And I handed him my rod. And I grabbed a rod and threw out there. Yeah. And and I and I ended up hooking a fish and hooking a fish uh, that were pretty big, but not giant. And then the last fish I hooked after I caught those two was the big one. And it was a big, big one. We needed it. And I hadn't retied that line um, because I hadn't been using that rod and reel. And it had what we called a split shot at the time, a little finesse bait, you know, back on a, just a split shot. And uh, it broke off. And I said, 
we got a rock, man. We got one minute to spare and we got this many miles to go. And that wide open, we're going to get in, you know, with one, one and a half minutes. So I cracked the boat open, wide open. We get back several miles to weigh in. Luckily, it was flat. We get in. We win the tournament. So the classics, Rondo Bay. John and I are, are down at the foot of the bay fishing in Rondo Provincial Park where I used to work as a teenager for the Natural Resources. Um, just when I was finishing high school, I worked there for two, two seasons. And I throw under a boat dock down there and skid one under there and miss it. John throws a perfect pitch under there, under the dock, hooks it, catches it. It's about a three and three quarter pound large one. We put it in the well. He throws the smallest one back. At that point, I said, we have to rock and roll, man. We got nine miles to the other end of the Bay and Erie. Oh, we ain't got but like 10 minutes. Hammered the boat just as, you know, he's getting his life jacket on. And I said, hold on. I ain't letting up for nothing. Boat weights or nothing. We ran there wide open. We got there with, I think it was about 40 seconds to spare. And we won the, the bass boat. We won their classic. So that was pretty <laughs> nice. Cool. I mean, but, but there were so many of those. Like, I mean, when you fish tournaments for 40 some odd years, you, there's so many of those last minute heroics or last minute, you know, losses or whatever. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of them, but I'll tell you one thing. You don't forget those things. You know, yeah. you, you remember those. And when you have a real crappy tournament, you try to think of the good things, but it's hard to, you don't even, all you can think of is, is how bad you did in a tournament, not anything good. You know? <laughs> who who here has won a tournament? We always do this, Bob. Who here on this panel has won a tournament? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Mike's won a tournament now. He's won a tournament. He's a champion. Santos, not yet. Man, Bob, Bob can put his hand up. I guess. Bob can put his hand up all the time, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, you know what though? It's it's hard. It it's hard winning a tournament. It is, yeah. As you guys know, it's there's so many things that have to go right, and you don't have. I mean, you know, in, nowadays, if you have a few things that go wrong, usually you're not going to win, and it, you almost hear it. I, I'd say one out of, or I'd say. Two out of three or three out of four tournaments in the U.S. on the big tournaments like Bassmaster Elites and Major League Fishing Net, you almost hear the guy will say, you know, 50 to 75% of the time, nothing went wrong. I landed every fish I hooked. You know, they didn't lose any fish. They didn't make any mechanical mistakes uh, fighting fish or, or, you know, bringing a fish in too hot or something like that. I, You know, there's so many things that can go wrong, and it's hard for everything to go right and just you know run perfectly where it's like boom 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 falls in place next thing you know you go i can't believe that just happened but you know you went through a one day or a three day tournament and you came out on top but but it's uh um, it, 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 there's a lot of factors there you know and it's it's there's not one factor that makes all these guys that are winning tournaments um good it's it, it's a lot of things it's it's being in tune with nature, being, you know, intuition, um, very, very small percentage of luck. I'm talking like that much. Yeah. Um, but but it's making the right decisions. I mean, decisions are everything. And that's fun fishing, too. If you're out in the water and you're not catching them. I mean, Gord Pizer, for instance. Gord did a radio show years ago. Uh, well, we did it for over 30 years. But one of the topics I remember he did one year was when the fish are biting, I change techniques. And it was a great topic because basically what Gord was saying is if the fish are hammering a specific technique, that's when he tries something else to try to perfect it or get better with it. Because he knows the fish are on whatever they were hitting, you know. So now he's going to try something different to see if he can replicate the success he was having with this technique, right? So, you know, to me, that's a, a great thing to do. But how many people will do that? Most of us get stubborn, stuck in a rut. If we're catching whale and the hell out of the fish using a certain technique, we don't want to change because why mess with success? But in his case, it was his way of learning to become a better angler. You know, and I love hearing those type of stories because to me, I I know that there's so much more to learn. You know, when I when I see all the great anglers out there and I fish with some of them and watch them on, you know, some of these lives and stuff, and I I, I see their mechanics and their their you know electronics know-how and and everything that they're doing i'm watching 
And if I pick up one thing every time I'm watching something, I, I feel good about it, you know, and I usually do. But it costs a lot of money keeping up with all that tackle nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. Oh, we can listen if to I could take this, hours. if I could take this laptop hours. and show you tackle, yeah. you guys would say we could open up a couple of warehouse stores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, looking for the magic baits. Yeah. Do you got a, you got a favorite presentation or lure? Well, I, I like largemouth fishing, so yeah. I, I like flipping heavy cover for largemouth if I had to do one thing, but but that doesn't win tournaments nowadays. It, it did win a lot of tournaments for me in the early years here in southern Ontario, but with smallmouth dominating so many, so many of the lakes now, if you're not a you know good smallmouth angler, you're going to get lost in the dust on even some of the, the places that largemouth used to dominate, yeah. smallmouth dominate now, and you have to catch them. So got to go after the brownies. The brownies, I like that. Brownies, eh? <laughs> yep. Brownies are good. Hey. If I said it, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> Every week you're about we got beast of the month. You're uh you have not usually the guest picks the winner, but we've only got one this week because it's uh the season. Oh, that's good. I love that's an good. easy he picks pick. It, yeah. <laughs> there's only one there is Dino Branfield. He's down in Louisiana right now with a redfish actually. Have you ever caught a redfish before? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've, uh, the best redfish fishing I ever did was with a guide out of uh, Cape Canaveral, um, you know, where the Nassau has their thing. We caught giant redfish there, yeah. like monsters. I didn't even know they got that big. And that was like 25, 30 years ago. But that spoiled me. That was the best redfish. And then Bernie Schultz and I did one on the Gulf of Mexico on the other side there in Florida. And did so, a number of redfish shows. Louisiana did some. And fished them all over the place but they're 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 fun because it's like a lot of it is sight fishing some of it isn't but uh some of the redfish fishing is sight fishing and you're fishing for those things rooting around in the shallow eel grass and weeds and that's pretty cool and then others you're fishing you know like shoots where the tide's going out or coming in and catching them where you can't really see them and that but yeah, they're kind of like a giant saltwater bass you know they look like drum to me actually is what they, they do like yeah, yeah. Fun See, to yeah, catch, eh? cool. but, uh, well, yeah, I guess this go. person there wins. Go. There you go, Dino. Does win. Dino Bradfield, <laughs> uh, Bob picked you actually. He picked your <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Uh, now, what what did he win? Like 10, 10 000, or how much? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Not, <laughs> Not there yet. Not there yet. Next winnings when he wins his next tournament. There you go. You guys are in together now. Remember, you're talking about that dragon rights, right? The Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. you, know, you, you got to be sensitive with me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's overtime here, man. If you were just joining us late, the Casting Podcast, we have Mr. Bobby Zumi, the man, the myth, the legend, the yeah. legend uh, on the show today. Such an honor, honor, Bob, to have you here. Of course, we can listen to you for, for we were listening to you for hours straight before you even went on the air. We should have just went live. But uh, fantastic, Bob, man. Thanks for, uh, for joining us. Like, I, I mean, I can't, I can't well, tell you enough. Well, you know, my well, pleasure, yeah. guys. And, and good seeing you guys. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen you. And uh, I just Long looked time. at my, I just looked at my, my time here on my phone. And, and I, I don't know if Todd Curry was watching earlier. He said he was going to tune in, but he's the guy <laughs> I was talking about before we went on live that, you know, won the Canadian, uh, or actually he won the Thousand Islands Open is what he won yeah. um, right. a couple of years ago. But he's won a lot of tournaments and he's like a super, uh, multi-species angler but he's waiting for me to call him he might be sleeping now because it's like 10 30 what is it 10 37 ontario time because i know he gets up early and he's wrapping a bunch of trucks but he needs answers from me on wrapping one of my rangers for tournaments thanks for waiting he, Todd, man. Thank he, you. he texted me just about three minutes before we yeah. went on and i said i'll call you at 9 30 which would have been an hour and eight minutes ago <laughs> A <laughs> um, bunch of thank yous from the audience here, man. Fantastic. Yeah, I tell you, awesome. this is uh, Bob Izumi. Come on. This is like, give it up for Mr. Bob Izumi on the show here. He's uh, the second most famous person to be on the show. That's nice. And, and oh, these, these guys I, are rapping. Who are you talking about? Who are you talking about, man? There is no one. <laughs> That's nice. He <laughs> <laughs> was Daryl Crosby. Daryl Crosby. Daryl. <laughs> See, you know, I learned a long time ago, politicians do that. You know, they just compliment you when you say yeah. that, you know? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. 
I can I can sleep tonight not knowing who the other one was. <laughs> Because you know why? I don't care. That's right. <laughs> You're living the life now, man. Where, where can people follow you still, Bob? Where hey, when you don't have you? a TV show now, you don't have to be as political, right? No, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. The thing is with me is what you see is what you get, and you guys know yeah. that. You know, oh, you, yeah, you, awesome, you, you awesome. remember awesome. 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 Meeting yeah, you in person, all that kind of uh, stuff. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, that's the <laughs> yeah. It's not as you know. You're not as lucky as some people might think. But anyway, um, <laughs> so on that note, I'm gonna let you guys go. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna text uh, my buddy Todd Curry, and if he doesn't answer, I'm gonna know you guys talked way too much tonight. Okay? <laughs> Bob and Zuby, everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much, Bob. You guys, Thank you, Thank you so care. much. Take care. Bye bye. All right. All right. Once again, folks, that was uh, Bob and Zuby. Thank you guys for joining us. We went well to overtime. It's usually one hour. Appreciate yeah. you guys, man. Uh, every Monday, 8.15. We've been on since 2017. Uh, we're still here on YouTube. Uh, follow the Kicker Fish channel and on Facebook. Uh, check us out on Instagram, too. Mike Natoli, Jeremy Santos. How was that? That was cool, though, eh? That was, that was, that was awesome, man. That's why. Nice thing is I That's didn't have to call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, man, you just asked Bob a you question. Ask question, question he's gone. Yeah. It's perfect. Talks, it's awesome, When me and Sasaki were down south with him, it was uh, with Darren, too, and uh, Terry McClymouth. You like just over Tim Hortons because Wayne owns a bunch of Tims, and we just you just say one thing, and I would just say, "How are the Raptors?" And yeah. boom, all of a sudden, I'm hearing about Roland Martin, or whatever. It's <laughs> awesome stuff, man! Awesome stuff. Awesome, we, yeah. we appreciate you guys, man. We'll see you guys next week again, uh, where we'll have who's our guest next week. I don't know what's going to top that, but uh, it's gonna be tough. <laughs> we have to wait a while, man. Oh, yeah, the <laughs> and the Raptors want to. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'll see you guys next week for Mike Totally, Jeremy Santos. And Eric Obolfa, it's the Castanet Podcast. Peace out. Peace. Peace. And broadcast from.